Okay, Dr. Great. Trivet, we're all set. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. My name is Dr. Crystal Trivet. I am a curator at UCLA Libraries, Special Collections and Archives. And I would like to welcome you to the Black Liberation Movement and Radical Community Education, a panel presentation taking place as part of UC Irvine Community Center's 1619 project series. Before we begin, I would like to thank the UCI Humanity Center and its many co-sponsors, of which there are too many to name here, but you can see them here on the slide, for putting on such an important and timely series. How can education be part of the long arc of resistance in Black America? What does liberatory education for Black, Indigenous, and people of color look like? An esteemed group of panelists will explore these and other questions today. I will begin this afternoon's program by introducing our speakers in the order in which they will speak. Following the panel presentations, I will help facilitate a conversation among our speakers on topics raised during their talks. This portion of the program will last one hour and will be followed at 5 p.m. by a post-panel discussion. The goal of the post-panel discussion is to create a space for the audience to share your thoughts and reactions to the panel presentation and suggested readings. Three amazing graduate students will facilitate the discussion. Throughout the program, we welcome you to put your question in the Q&A feature. Angela LeBanc Ernest will be our first speaker. Her work focuses on American history post 1965 with an emphasis on the modern black freedom struggle. She is a graduate of Harvard University with a BA in Afro-American studies, graduated from Stanford University with an MA in American history. The founding director of the Black Panther Party Research Project at Stanford, her work on the Black Panther Party's history includes the study of women, the impact of gender in the party, and the organization's community survival programs. She is the director of the OCS Project LLC, created to recover, preserve, and foster curriculum-based projects and community-based conversations about the Black Panther Party's Oakland Community School. She also is a co-founder of the Intersectional Black Panther Party History Project. Currently, she is producing and directing a documentary film about the Oakland Community School. Erica Huggins is an educator, Black Panther, Black Panther Party member, former political prisoner, human rights advocate, and poet. For 45 years, she had lectured in the United States and internationally on restorative practices and the role of spiritual practice in creating social change. Erica speaks on campuses and in communities about the importance of inclusive grassroots movements, past and present. Erica was professor of sociology and African-American studies from 2011 through 2015 in the Peralta Community College District. At Merritt College, home of the Black Panther Party, she co-created and taught a course titled The Black Panther Party Strategies for Organizing the People. Currently, Erica works with World Trust Educational Services, facilitating conversations focused on race and gender equity. In addition, she facilitates workshops on radical self-care for women of color. Dr. Damien M. Sojourner is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at UCI. He researches the relationship among the public education system, prisons, and the construction of Black masculinity in, South, in Southern California. In addition to his work appearing in many popular media forums, he has written articles in scholarly journals, such as Transforming Anthropology, Race, Education, and Ethnicity, Cultural Anthropology, and the Berkeley Review of Education. His book entitled First Strike, Prison and Educational Enclosures in Black Los Angeles was released by the United, uh, University of Minnesota Press. He is currently completing a book manuscript that analyzes the relationship between contemporary Black liberation efforts and the carceral state. Dr. Roderick Crooks is an assistant professor in the Department of Informatics at the Bren School of Information and Computer Sciences at UCI. His research examines how the use of digital technology by public institutions extracts resources from minoritized and racialized communities. His current project explores how community organizers based in working class Black and Latinx communities use data for activist projects, even as they dispute the proliferation of data intensive technologies in education, law enforcement, financial services, and other vital sites of public life. <laughs> 
He has published um, extensively in human computer interaction, science and technology studies, and social science venues on topics including political theories of online participation, equity, and access and document theory. So we are now um, ready for our first uh, panelist. Um, take it away, Angela. Thanks, Crystal. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. Um, just to share my information about the Black Panther Party, the Oakland Community School, and also to share some of my ideas about my relationship to education and how it shaped my current work. When I think about African Americans education in 1619, I think about the issue of access and how we weren't allowed to learn to read, how educating yourself and each other were subversive acts and literal threats to life that accompanied these acts of resistance. People were killed because they dared learn to read or help someone else learn. I think about how African-Americans dared to be, dared to do, and defied the odds, excelling in all subjects and as creatives and entrepreneurs. And yet uplifting our history and our knowledge was not what traditional historians and society valued as American history, despite the many African-American inventors, thought leaders, and cultural trendsetters. I consider the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense that originated in Oakland a part of that tradition. They challenged the status quo, advocated liberation, addressed human needs, and subsequently faced government repression and literal death for such advocacy and activism. Nevertheless, their ideas and programs spread across the nation and the world. At its October 1966 founding, only 54 years ago, the Black Panther Party's organizational charter included a demand for an education system that reflected the true history of Black people. I want to pause for a second just because I want to give um, the slide an opportunity to catch up with slide three um, of the 10 point platform. <clears throat> At its October 1966 founding, only 54 years ago, the Black Panther Party's organizational charter included a demand for an education system that reflected the true history of Black people. The Intercommunal Youth Institute, which evolved into the Oakland Community School, became one of the party's answers to their own call. Many Black Panther Party members and supporters had experienced negative and inadequate education themselves, yet they saw the role education could play in liberation. They ranged from non-high school graduates to graduate degree holders. Indeed, in Oakland, Merritt College was the intellectual home of the Black Panther Party. After its formation, Black Panther members created breakfast programs and liberation schools and visited high schools where they took the opportunity to teach and tutor students and expose them to history, culture, and politics. The party started the Intercommunal Youth Institute for Black Panther Party members' children in 1971. The Child Development Center on slide four was for the youngest of the children. By fall 1973, the Institute had moved to a permanent location at 6118 East 14th Street in Oakland and was operated by the newly created nonprofit Educational Opportunities Corporation. On slide five, unlike its first iteration, the school now was open for the larger community and eventually changed its name to the Oakland Community School. One of the school's mottos was the world is a child's classroom. The school logo on slide six to the left embodies this. It was drawn by M. Gail Asali Dixon, a party member and female graphic artist for the Black Panther newspaper. She also taught art at the school. The staff exposed the children to the world both inside and outside the classroom, within and away from the brick and mortar building. Learning experiences were everywhere and they were encouraged and expected to explore. The students received a stellar education with small class sizes, dedicated teachers, and a wide ranging curriculum that expanded over time. And as you can see with the list on slide seven, children were taught from ages two and a half years to 11 years old, 
they were encouraged to investigate, research, and find the answers. They learned reading, math, science, language arts, social studies, music, dance, art, hygiene and grooming, and foreign languages. OCS hosted spelling, math, and Black history bees, annual science fairs, and competed at city competitions against public school youth. On slide eight, um, you see an article from Jet Magazine from February 1976 that uh, gives you examples of what the classes looked like and some of the teachers. They were encouraged at a group of 10 year old OCS students even presented a clean water treatment science project at a Western region black engineers conference in the Bay Area. On the next slide, we can see that performing arts were a central OCS experience. Not only was it their opportunity to learn songs and dances, but the content was crucial and intentional. The instructors were there to help students with the plays and skits they wrote. The topics included African culture and history to black history and native history. They performed comedic pieces as well as serious pieces. These were the students' opportunities to learn as well as teach family and community attendees in the audience about the subject or the culture reflected in the performance. In the same building, as we can see in slide 10, during after school hours and on weekends, the Oakland Community Learning Center hosted programs for the broader community, especially teens and seniors. An escort program for seniors, a GED program for adults, a film series, discos for teens, as well as employment opportunities and martial arts were but a few. Add to that visiting activists from local, national, and international movements and cultural icons all moved through the 6118 landscape, often hosting fundraisers for the school and the center. It's no wonder there are so many names for the same place. That's why I decided uh, to try a different approach to get at the meaning of the school. At the end of each interview I conduct, I conduct for the documentary film, I ask each interviewee the same question. What are five words that describe your OCS experience? I plugged in the words in the word map generator and on slide 11, you see what those top words were of 50 interviews. To date, the top five words that represent the OCS experience are love, community, education, compassion, and strength. The interviewees' responses are a partial explanation for why I think it's important to study and archive Oakland Community School history. The documentary project combines historical research, digital content creation, and filmmaking in an effort to make inroads into educational knowledge and practice. So when we fast forward um, two slides, actually the slide 13, why OCS? OCS pro provides a model for how education can be designed to meet each child's whole needs, physical, intellectual, psychological, emotional, and spiritual. Community and family were central to this model. Class was not important to who worked at the, at the school and who attended the school. Teachers, students, and volunteers were from all classes, cities, and backgrounds. Love for the children was the focus. So when I step back from all the research that I've been doing over the years, um, on slide 14, there's the beginning of a sentence to study OCS is. And to study OCS is um, a variety of things. To study, it's to study the essence of the Black Panther Party, to explore the nuts and bolts of community organizing around education, to study the impact of a small community school on the alternative schools movement, the small schools movement, and the public school system, to study the role the survival programs played in building individuals and families, to encounter history makers and culture bearers, to work at the intersections of literature, history, performing arts, education, music, visual arts, urban development, community activism, local, national, and international politics, coalition politics, economics, and service learning. To study OCS is to center children and community and explore the world through their eyes, to understand the ways in which in interventions in education can change a child's perspective of and engagement in the world, 
and to expand our perspective of Oakland and of the Black Panther Party. And I just wanna take a couple minutes for some personal reflections. As the project relates to my life, I'm roughly the age of OCS students. I was three when OCS opened at its permanent location. And while I'm doing the work, I often think about my educational experience in comparison to what the OCS children experienced. For many years, I believed that what I currently do is happenstance. However, as I've been reflecting on my relationship to formal education, I realized that throughout my life, it's been a bittersweet relationship. Growing up in Louisiana, I was told that getting a degree was the key to success and the high profile career making big money. Yet I also observed educational access and resources meet it unequally across classes and neighborhoods. And I often felt that my intellectual abilities and interests were under attack. That what I was learning was not always what I needed to know to survive. I was privy to how different children in the lowest economic classes were educated. Lack of, so, lack of resources, overcrowded classrooms, food scarcity, IQ tests, differences in treatment between those considered quote smart versus those considered quote class clowns and troublemakers. During undergrad, I saw other departments flourish while our African-American studies struggled and fought for resources. In graduate school, I experienced the prejudice and isolation that accompanies the exploration of non-traditional research material and methods. To do the work and remain sane, I found allies and mentors, advisors, fellow, co fellow cohort members, staff across disciplines, and community folk. In addition to human support, technology is one of my newest allies. For decades, I literally transported my oral histories across the world with me, wondering when I would ever have an opportunity to use and foreground these narratives. Finally, the technology exists, and even during the pandemic, I've been able to continue gathering these lived histories that are such a crucial component of the Digital Humanities Project. So I've reached the end of my formal presentation, and I'm going to pass the mic to my friend, my mentor, and my colleague, Erica Huggins. Erica, you're muted. Thank you, Angela. I really appreciated hearing your experience um, of being the same age as the former Oakland Community School students and the trajectory of your own education. So, um, Welcome everybody. Thank you, uh, Crystal. And thank you everybody on that long list of people who put this evening together. And um, I, my comments are pretty simple. Um, I thought a lot about what radical community education is. And the word radical gets tossed around and connected to um, various um, entities. And how I think of it is something that comes with wonder and curiosity and imagination. And so revolutionary education as it was when I was the director of the Oakland Community School is imaginative, based in curiosity and based in an understanding of learning for all ages, for everyone, not only those who have access to private education, elementary through post-secondary education and beyond. Learning is a human endeavor. So how does radical community education express itself? Well, first of all, it's culturally humble. The children at Oakland Community School weren't just African-American children. There were Latinx children, indigenous children. There were white children, one of whom said to me jokingly and seriously that he never knew he was white until he left Oakland Community School and entered public school. In its deliberate, 
delivery. Radical community education recognizes all learning styles, all languages and dialects and ways of being. It honors the whole being, not just the head or the mind, but the body, the spirit, the emotions, the joy of being human. Radical community-based learning, um, the communities in which they sit are not therefore based solely in a male and Eurocentric paradigm, nor is intelligence judged by its standards and analyses. There is a history, and Angela mentioned this, of access to education that existed in Africa prior to the transatlantic slave trade. Do we know about it? Do we know about it? Do we study it? We do know about the violent punishment received by African men, women, and children who bravely learned to read and write. Think about that as a fact, but also as a reality. Imagine that you're this little girl or boy caught with a book and beaten or disfigured. This history moved forward uninterrupted into the Jim Crow era and beyond in, and its structural vestiges exist in public education today. I don't really think I need to explain how. I think we're all good people here and we all can use our brilliant minds to determine how the vestiges of it exist. And the history of indigenous people in North America is similar and it's violent denial to allow tribal peoples to continue their own ways of learning and being and deny their access to public education, except that which they were sequestered and allowed to be engaged with. I want to say it is their stolen land on which we stand, on which we sit, which we learn, on which we make profit. It is important to see where we are in our communities, where we came from, and what learning environments we can imagine and or recreate for African-American people and people of color and for people who do not identify as people of color. Education and learning are not synonymous. Learning is a natural human endeavor and education is often created to support caste. So thank you for listening. And Crystal, you can let us know who's next. Dr. Damien Sojourner is next. Hello, thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Erica. Um, I appreciate the invitation to be on the panel and to be in conversation uh, with everybody as well. Um, I'm gonna keep my comments uh, extremely brief because I'm really um, interested in uh, the dialogue amongst uh, everybody. Um, so I guess I just have uh, two main points uh, the first is, what is the function of education in the United States? Um, that is, I think it's important for us to begin to parse through what has been uh, sort of given as a public education model, which is based, a part, based upon a historical uh, process where Black people demanded education during Reconstruction that education model was thereby circumvented from a sort of a loosely formed coalition of the US Army, finance and industrial capital, um, this burgeoning United States social science theoretical tradition that denigrated black life and also a philanthropic sector. And this would pretty much form what we know right now as public education. Um, and that the purpose of that model was in fact to uh, train Black people to serve as a menial class within this new Southern economy that had to be rebuilt. And that same sort of model of training Black people for a very particular ends is still what we have um, going on right now. Now, 
given that long tradition, because I'm not going to detail that history, we would be here uh, all day. And that's not uh, what people came here uh, to listen to. But rather, the, this feeds into the second question, which is how do we support um, Black communal traditions, such as those outlined by Angela and Erica, to completely have a different social vision of what education should be. Um, that entails uh, freedom schools that have um, appeared all over the, the country. That also entails efforts to meet in what we can consider fugitive spaces. That is spaces that may exist for a month or two, but then for various reasons have to close down, disappear. How is it that we make that legible? How is it that we support that? And perhaps turn those spaces into something more permanent, um, if can be. Um, and there, there are several of those traditions that are happening um, right now. I've been working a lot with the Southern California Library located in South Central Los Angeles. And on a continuous basis, there are a group of youth or a group of youth uh, who meet and try to educate themselves in various ways. Um, but it's not, it's not easy at all. It's looked at as being something that they should not be doing. They should be going to regular school, quote unquote. But it's also um, something that they love to do at the same time. So how is it that we come together and understand that the system that is in place, which um, I think for the first time in a long time, is actually being uh, under question given the pandemic and people sort of understanding that much of what is being taught is not necessarily needed for uh, what we consider to be education, but rather has a, a different purpose um, in mind. So perhaps we can use that energy that's in the current moment as a way to, to really push um, for something completely different. So I'll uh, stop my comments uh, right there. Uh, once again, I'm excited to be a part of um, this conversation. Uh, and thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Our last panelist is Dr. Crooks. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm going to also try to be brief, but uh, probably not as brief as Professor Sojoyner, who is an absolute pro at this. Um, so, and also, I want to say thank you to you, Crystal Tribbett, for or, uh, moderating the panel. So, I study the relationship between data intensive computing, education, state surveillance, and community resistance. Uh, so, briefly, I'm going to try to outline this uh, research agenda and describe how the continuing relevance of the Black Panther Party's approach to community control can be brought to bear on contemporary uh, surveillance technologies deployed in education. Um, and I'm thinking in particular of a certain rearticulation of the Black Panther Party's 10 point program, one that I've dated to 1972, that says we want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, peace, and people's community control of modern technology. So all of my research is set uh, amid the ongoing technological transformation of so-called urban schools in Southern California. And these are the public schools that serve working class Latinx and black communities. And as in other intensely racially segregated schools across the United States, the pursuit of access to digital technology is a value that animates uh, financial investments, policy proposals and pedagogical decisions and has done so for two decades. And this represents a largely unquestioned consensus of public policy, common sense, philanthropy, and research. Currently, this push for access to digital technologies takes two forms. Uh, first, the use of mobile devices and laptops for student learning. And then secondly, the incorporation of technologies by school administrators. So these are the kinds of data intensive technologies that uh, collect, aggregate, and visualize data generated in the course of everyday schooling activities, primarily in the form of dashboards or other graphical conventions. Access to valorized forms of digital technology promises benefits at a variety of scales. Early experiences with technology will nudge Black and Latinx youth from the working class towards useful higher education, especially in STEM disciplines, and ultimately position them for high paying jobs. Urban schools themselves will be remade, rescued from decades of putative dysfunction and mismanagement by reorganization around the tools and techniques of the tech sector. And then finally, minoritized and racialized communities, communities themselves will also benefit from access to technology via public and philanthropic investment. Uh, investments that portend inclusion of youth of color in the tech sector and an attendant class mobility. 
the capture and aggregation of education data both disciplines and enables so the same data that personalized learning also allow institutions to predict predict student success or failure in course completion identify problem students or evaluate faculty productivity effectively students and teachers in working class schools are made accountable to various outside stakeholders via data Despite this troubling status quo, the rewards of data intensive computation are not only trumpeted by self interested technologists and self declared evangelists, they are also vigorously pursued by educators, students and teachers in working class communities of color. Why then, despite this high minded, popular and plausible formation, has access to technology yet to deliver any such benefits to its presumed beneficiaries? From the perspective of sociological research on datification and racial capitalism, access to technology appears not as a distribution of needed goods, but as the configuration of a resource field, a field marked by extractions of capital from minoritized communities and the state to the tech sector. Likewise, access as a resource field points to forms of capital allocated to selected individuals, but rarely to communities or other collective forms of life. So I've also been interested in community responses to data intensive modes of public schooling, primarily in the form of community organizing and public advocacy. While activists in minoritized communities have long deployed quantitative practices to argue for desired policies, draw public attention to socioeconomic inequality and foment institutional change, contemporary community organizers operate amid intensified expectations about the evidentiary and communicative capacities of data. Community organizers have begun in many places to dispute and resist the expansion of surveillance via data intensive technologies and drawn attention to attempts to incorporate educational technologies into the state's carceral apparatus. For example, community organizers in Minneapolis joined together to form the coalition to stop the cradle to prison algorithm, summarizing an argument there against the pervasive and undisciplined circulation of data captured in the course of schooling. As these organizers have depicted it, data intensive computation merely contributes to surveillance abuse, over policing, and other forms of harm visited by the state on black and brown people. In my own work, I argue for decoupling the civic aims of education from narratives about technological progress. Like previous forms of computing applied to schooling, contemporary data intensive ed tech can never accomplish its decades long project of making public education computable and has needlessly sacrificed other virtues in pursuit of this goal. I call for a revisitation of the civic responsibilities of education and the continual abdication of the American state of its duty to address systemic racism. Until such time as digital technologies are made accountable to working class communities of color, they can never serve liberatory ends. I argue that people's community control of technology provides a conceptual tool for the creation as yet unaccomplished and unseen of a civic computational regime for working class people of color. Such a regime would capture the work that goes into creating, processing and circulating educational data, including the labor of teachers, students, parents and data professionals for the benefit of working class communities of color. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for such thought provoking presentations. Um, we began the panel uh, with reflections on um, Angela's work, archiving stories of the Black Panther Party's Oakland Community School. And then Erica built on Angela's talk by delving deeper into questions about radical community education. Both Angela and Erica remind us of the importance of acknowledging history in order to imagine and plan for the future of education. Uh, Professor Sejoyner asked how we can create communal education spaces, spaces for students of color. And our final panelist, Dr. Crooks, discussed education technology and working class communities of color. Um, and his presentation raises questions about how the Black Panther approach to education relates to the present. Um, at this time, um, I will work to field questions from the audience. Um, but before I do so, I would like to invite our panelists to ask each other questions um, because I think they are all very interested in each other's work and experiences. Um, so uh, while I take a peek at the chat, um, if someone has a question, please feel free um, to unmute yourself. And if I have to, I will ask the first question. <laughs> Roger, thank you so much for picking up on um, the technology question um, from the 1972 10-point platform and program. And Erica, one of the things 
that I've often wondered in doing my own work um, was what what would what kind of technology would you say was used at the Oakland Community School? But I think people often want to know if they can replicate the school. One of the big changes now is like so much technology that we have now that we didn't have then. And so I'm wondering and knowing what the technology question was about because you were in the party, um, how did technology factor into what happened at Oakland Community School and how might you see it playing itself out? Erica, you're muted. Thank you. Um, I'm used to playing with my mute button myself and <laughs> it's happening magically. Um, that is a great set of questions, Angela. And what I wanna say is the reality is that technology um, was more the thing that we wanted to see. We didn't have access to um, cell phones, the internet, electronic devices of all kinds. One of the beautiful things that, um, that I remember is the beauty of people because the technology was used, that which existed at that time in the, in the 70s was used to um, surveil us, track us, arrest us, kill us. Even though we were, uh, many of us, just teachers or staff at Oakland Community School working every day for many, many hours a day with children. So what I wanna say is that I recently have learned about the power of handwriting. There's research on writing notes of writing comments to oneself about your own experience, that learning is retained with that physicality. It's a, skin, a kinesthetic um, process that gets lost on the laptop or listening on a phone or writing on a phone. It's okay that we have it. I love that we have it. But I think that we always looked for a balance. If the technology used against us was used to protect and serve us in reality, we wouldn't have felt that way. But it was not. And you see, um, as Damien mentioned, he didn't say it in this way. There is apartheid education in the United States and there always has been. So now that technology can be used to serve people. And I really wanna press how important it is for us to use our physical bodies as well as this technology to, to have our emotional intelligence at the fore as we use the technology and not be uh, so dependent on it for the rhythm of our lives. So I hope I answered your question. You may have had other questions layered in there. Angela, thank you. I have a question if we uh, have time. Um, one of the struggles that I see right now in trying to establish uh, cohesion and sort of buy in to what I guess best would be considered an alternative to the public education structure. Um, Black independent schools is what I'm thinking about right now or in particular formations that are not maybe so um, formed uh, is there is a lot of class dynamics at play 
which there's a huge buy-in from more or less like the black middle class into the traditional structure of education. That is like you do X, Y, and Z, and then you'll succeed even if these structures reproduce violence upon black youth. Um, what is this the case uh, with sort of the formation of independent schools, community schools um, during the 1960s and 70s? And if it was, what were some of the strategies, not so much to get buy-in from the black middle class, because I know that was never sort of like the, the quest or goal, but how um, was the framework within the school uh, situated completely differently that it didn't reproduce those same normative understandings of what education should be so as to that question doesn't even pop up as a possibility. Erica or Angela, do you, do you have any thoughts on this? I have lots of thoughts. Angela, what do you, what's your response? Well, one of the things that um, popped into my mind was um, kind of thinking about how, like why this school was formed in and of itself. It was, it was an evolutionary project. So, um, no one sat around saying we're going to create a school um, to the extent that the Black Panther Party members were organizing in the communities. They were um, young as they got older, they had children, and they had to grapple with the issue of how is it that they educate their children, how, how can you, how can they um, create a space for children to be safe? One, because they were doing this work while they were under surveillance and attack. So one, we need a space to put all of the children that's safe, right? We need them protected. But then as the children, started getting older, they, had, they realized that they needed to be able to create a space where children could learn and learn effectively and learn how to think, not what to think. And so um, because class wasn't a factor in that kind of evolutionary part of it, then I think that um, what you got was something that wasn't um, middle class versus lower class versus what's the best way to move our kids into society. And like with me, right? Go to school, go to go to school, get a get a degree, get a good job, lawyer, doctor, kind of thing. So I think that the the class dynamic wasn't the same because it was an organic development. And because the community that they were a part of then began to see their success and wanted their children to, who were being um, maligned at school. You know, one parent told me the story of her son who the teacher punished um, because he couldn't, he, he couldn't keep still by putting him under a desk and making him sit under the desk, that was his punishment. That had nothing to do with education. So um, the community was a part of that growth of the school. And so I think that that was one of the ways that they actually got around that issue. Like it wasn't an issue. You had, like I mentioned, you had people who um, were middle class, upper middle class, we might consider today sending their students to the school. You had people who were extremely poor, whose kids were accepted and loved and brought into the school. So that was my thinking, my initial, you know, response to it. What are you thinking, Erica? Well, um, Damien, thank you for that um, big question. Public school is where most of our children are, without question. 
unless we have access to private school. And the charter hybrid is, is doable, but it isn't quite like the model that Oakland Community School became. And it was intentionally a model. See what we're doing? You can do this. You can do this anywhere in the world. And what I started to think about is the fact that, as Angela, you just said, the parents came to us and they said, your children are happy in that little house. This is before Oakland Community School. Angela went through the, the various incarnations of the, the school projects that we had. They begged us to allow their children to come and be with our children. Why? It's very simple. We love them as they are. We value them. They are all brilliant. There is no not brilliant child. And in that, that paradigm that was set up to warehouse children in the early days of the United States and its development um, created once again, divisions between humans. Not just the racial constructed divisions, but the class constructed divisions. We wanted none of that. We didn't even talk about it. That's how much we did. It was like not in our awareness. So when the parents said, we want the school and then behind that a grandparent said, and it needs a dedicated school site so we don't have to move from place to place. That was when the Black Panther Party and specifically Huey Newton, by the way, said, then we should have a school and a group of friends of the party bought the school building, an old church. And when I say model and that it could be replicated anywhere, I have seen this happen. And I'm thinking right now of a group of um, middle to upper class Afro-Brits. I found this out on Facebook that they were creating, they were replicating Oakland Community School in this tiny little set of 10 or 15 families because they so admired what we did. They'd never met me. They'd only read about it in a Black Panther Party newspaper or perhaps somewhere else, but they wanted to have a school where their children would feel loved and valued and that their brilliance would continue to shine. That's what we were about. And so I encourage them because, you know, it, when you're trying to start something and you're not living in a time where everything is moving in an uplifting direction and you're not in a place that's going to support this organic development of a model, then you, you need to hear someone say, don't worry about money. Don't, don't worry about your curriculum in that kind of, once again, dominant culture way. Think about what is it that we want? What outcome do we wanna have for the children? We want them just to have a, a curriculum that teaches them to read and write and, and engage with mathematics and science? Or we do, do we want something more than that? And we wanted something more and we had it all built in so that every aspect of a child could engage. And we were parent friendly and we were tuition free. And I told this to my friends in, in London and they were so excited to approach doing this with their children. So I think I, you know, I, I know that um, all the human divisions uh, play out in a disservice to us, to all of us, actually. And um, I think if we want to start schools, we should start schools. And I'm not being Pollyanna about that. It's hard work, but we can do it because if we did it with no money, in 1973, I would imagine it can be done now. 
we've been socialized to believe there are certain things that must be in place first. And it's not like that, not necessarily. Thank you. Um, thank you both for, for such a really rich reflection on that question. Um, we have a question from an audience member um, that I think that uh, Erica, you've touched upon already a little bit, but um, this question comes from Kelly Chen and Kelly asked specifically about the financial source, uh, source and other resources that were difficult to access. So can you just speak um, a little bit more about um, tuition was free? How did, you know, how did the teachers get paid? Um, how were, um, was it volunteer work? Um, where were supplies coming from? That sort of thing. When the school, when in the various iterations of the school, we all worked for nothing. As a matter of fact, um, when the school, the Oakland Community School doors first opened at 6118 East 14th Street, now International Boulevard in Oakland, um, I have two children at that time and they were relatively young and I didn't have an income. And so I was on aid to needy families as the director of the school. I didn't feel anything about it. I figured I'm, I'm going to do good work. So why shouldn't I have something to pay my rent and not take it from the school? And then we got grant writing savvy. We had friends, black and brown friends in various levels of um, fundraising, nonprofit fundraising. And they let us know how to write a good grant. And we did. And that was how we were able to welcome staff who left their jobs at Oakland Unified School District, Berkeley Unified School District, San Francisco Unified School District, or provided at not paid internships, but pl places where young teachers could come and learn how to teach. I always feel that the best teacher is one who's also always willing to be a student. And that a student, if she or he looks inside, will find that ability to teach. And so we felt that way about the people who came to visit and work with us. And some people did volunteer. And the parents who would ordinarily be sitting at home, um, we welcomed them. We were not allergic to parents in our classrooms. We loved them. And we served three meals a day. How did we do that? Yet another grant provided, we started out with two meals, a, a grant provided funding for the third meal. It was because I believe it, all of this happened because this school was meant to be exactly as it was a model in community. And now there are people who have personal monies that could be contributed to a school like this. We had very little of that at first, but that also happened too in the form of fundraising events that we did. Um, remember Don Cornelius of Soul Train? He came to the school and did a radiothon to raise money for the school. And all these people from, as the children would say, from Hollywood, all these people came and performed so that money could be raised. And it was a radiothon. It was projected on KBLX radio. So people could give a dollar. They could give $5. They could give $100. They could come and volunteer their expertise, which is what people did. That was how we got people to help with curriculum or other things. So we just never doubted that this could happen. We imagined the impossible and then we did it. We brought it into reality. And I just remembered something, Roderick, that um, was a mainstay of our work in terms of technology and you probably ran into it but the school is an example of this. The power of the people is greater than the man's technology. 
So we knew that all the money was being held somewhere else in that 1%. But we knew that rather than whine about it, we were going to get access to some of it for good, for not to put in our pockets for good. And that's, that's how it happened. That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, the person who asked it, thank you very much. And can I, can I actually just add a couple of things, Erica? You made me also um, remember the small ways that fundraising happened and um, related to the students themselves. They would have their um, performances on Sundays or whatever day. And after the performance was over, there were baked goods that were sold, arts and crafts that were sold, meals that were sold. Um, there were draw there were like drawings. I mean, you had to be really creative. And at one point there was the intercommunal youth band that was led by Charles Moffitt and um, an amazing award-winning band, well-known around the Bay Area, but they would go to UC Berkeley and Laney College and they would um, participate with other musicians, um, like established musicians who would help in fundraising. It would be a fundraiser specifically in Cecil Williams at Glide Church in San Francisco. I mean, it was truly a community experience. Every component of the community was involved in um, financially sustaining, helping the school financially sustain itself. And, and provided human resources to it, that there's no amount of money that would, um, that, that we could have paid the people who came and offered their skills, knowledge and experiences. So it was because we were doing such a great thing for, as one grandmother said, for our babies. And because we were doing that, people just wanted to see it happening. Black people and brown people working together to make this happen. And I, I really believe very strongly that this can happen again. It keeps being replicated in various places, one time in Berkeley, one time in Oakland. Um, so hopefully uh, in Los Angeles. Well, uh, there is still a lot to talk about. Um, more questions come in from um, the audience. Um, and I'm excited to continue this conversation during the post panel discussion. Um, so I would like to um, encourage everyone, if you can, to stay for another 30 minutes so we can um, continue to talk amongst ourselves. Um, I would like to turn the program over to our three facilitators, and I'm going to introduce them. Um, Jessica Gonzalez is a doctoral student in the Department of Logic and Philosophy of Science at UCI. Her research focuses on the intersection between cognitive science, evolutionary bio biology, and moral philosophy. Tony Hayes is a PhD candidate in English at UCI. Um, she is currently working on a dissertation that analyzes the modes through which literary representation of the home in Asian American literature work through and alongside anti-Black housing legislation and gentrification. Brian Murray is a doctoral student in the School of Education at UCI. His current research involves preschoolers and school-aged children and focuses on understanding dialect use in African-American children. Um, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Trippett. Um, on behalf of my co-facilitators, Tony Hayes and Brian Murray, and myself, I would like to thank you for your comprehensive moderation of the panel discussion. Uh, we would also like to thank our esteemed panel, Angela LeBlanc Ernest, Erica Huggins, Dr. Damien Sojoyner, and Dr. Roderick Crooks for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us and for engaging in an insightful dialogue with one another. At this time, we would like to transition to a discussion between the audience and the panelists. The goal of this discussion will be to create a space that's open to reflection and if needed, clarification. To that end, we would especially like to welcome questions of the following nature. Were there ideas presented here that were new to you or that you would like to learn more about? 
If you would like to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A box. Tony, Brian, and I will be monitoring the discussions and will invite audience members to ask their questions. Uh, if you'd like us to, we will enable your mic for you to, to, for you to ask your question just to heighten the dialogue and discussion feel of this event. Uh, but if you prefer to type it, we can read it out loud for you. Um, and then just one more logistical note, please just be mindful of our short time together. Uh, so with that, I'd like to pass the mic to Tony, who will invite our first audience member to ask a question. Um, hello. Uh, the first question is related to um, thinking about um, some of the intersections or um, kind of modes of um, kind of moderating the several concerns that have to be moderated when attending to the education of children. Um, this person specifically is asking about um, how does an educator efficiently strike the balance between independent learning and a more highly structured, culturally re relevant didact didactic education? Um, is this type of education simply harm reduction or paternalism? So I'll leave it to the panelists to answer that question. I feel like I need to call on somebody. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. Um, Angela, do you have any thoughts on this? I actually don't. I, I kind of like to defer to people who um, who you know study that field. My my field was history. So um, I'll defer to people who study teaching children. I, I want to answer, but I'm not sure that I'm clear on the core question. So could you restate it again? Just, just, what you believe the question is about. Uh, sure. Um, I think what the, um, the question is asking, um, the question starts, I think one of the greatest challenges and privileges in being a student is the process of learning how to alchemize the forces in your life to transform them into something that can be heard and understood and even believed. However, and I speak as an after school youth programs director in a low income and high crime community, I struggle sometimes in giving my black and indig indigenous students the freedom to seek out the cruelty of their worlds and form their solutions or conclusions about them and to protect them from these harsh realities. Um, I think the question is asking how to moderate kind of the lived experiences of different kind of modes of oppression while also educating students with um, the knowledge to manage kind of the world outside of that as well. Damien, are you teaching? Thank you, Tony. Damien, are you teaching young ones? I. I, um, I, I mean, I'm teaching my own kids, <laughs> so they, <laughs> um, um, but I, I guess I'm trying to parse, I, I, I had the same response that you did. I was trying to understand the, the, the question more. I get, I get the question now. Thank you yeah. for reading the person's actual question. Thank you. It helped me. I, and, and I'm going to, maybe, do you want me to just try at it a little bit? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Roderick, is that okay with you? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, I think people just want to hear more of like your experience. And I think all of us are kind of envious and want to try to replicate it to some extent. So I think people want to just hear you talk more about like how we could do it again. That's how I heard the question. I don't know what everybody else heard. What I heard was how do we balance the harsh reality for our little ones with the, the the desire to protect them from from harm 
And what I knew at Oakland Community School and what I have learned since then, because I still, though I don't teach on a college campus anymore, very intentionally, um, I do work with children and I work with incarcerated youth. And I, you know, they're babies too. They're all under 17. And um, they already know the harsh reality of their circumstances. What they need is for someone to affirm that, yes, this is happening. Yes, that is the truth. And how would you like to see your world be? And those were the conversations I was having all those years ago with the children. And I'm still having those same conversations in public schools, in charter schools, in private schools, in community schools and in special schools. Um, special schools are the, the code name for the places for incarcerate, incarcerated youth, which I can't, I believe in restorative and not punitive practices. So I cannot find any good reason to put a 16 year old, a 17 year old, a 13 year old in prison. Can't find a reason can't find it. So if we honor the children when they're little and we let them ask all the questions and we are willing to support them in finding the answers because nobody has the answer. There is no one answer. But if, we're, if we can find the place in ourselves to clean away the things that get in the way of our own honesty with history and then share with children, affirm them in their lives. They know where they come from. They're, many of the houses from which black and brown children come from and indigenous children as well, there is some conversation going on about how the world works. And so we can just be good humans with them. And, and it, it isn't either or, it's both and in answer to the person's question. It's both and. And it means that the educator, the teacher, has to be willing to be a student over time. Can, can I add to that, uh, just to build on what you just said, Erica? I thought about um, most of the students who I interviewed who went to Oakland Community School. When they left the school, one of the things they talked about was um, the frustration they encountered um, because they were encouraged to ask any question they wanted to ask and to explore any line of investigation that they wanted to, and they could um, they could question the teacher's um, statement and if they could prove what they were saying, they weren't seen as troublemakers. They were respected, their questions and their thoughts were respected. And so when they transitioned into the schools that they attended, whether they left and went to a public school or a private school, they all to a person talked about how um, downtrodden they felt after a certain point because the teachers saw what they were doing as being quote unquote smarty pants or um, wanting to cause trouble in the class, but really they just wanted to know. And they had been in the space where they were encouraged to um, ask the hard questions that they didn't even necessarily think were hard questions, they were just trying to figure the world out, trying to make sense of what was around them. So I just wanted to add that, that children at young ages understand a lot um, and they have questions and it's incumbent upon us to, um, at least in my experience with you know, teaching my children, um, to be honest with them, um, but in, encourage them to move beyond it to think of ways to solve it 
to think of ways that give them agency to move through the difficult spaces. Mm -hmm. And to be willing to simply say, I don't know the answer to your question. Is it okay with you if I research a little bit and come back to you? We did that all the time. The children would ask us questions. We didn't have a clue what the answer was because we were not taught, but we were, we practiced a particular kind of humility. I don't know what else to call it. So that we were able to come back with something um, that landed well with them and they never forgot it. They never forgot it. Um, and by the way, that kind of education has helped them with their own children because now they have their own children. So thank you, Tony, thank you. So thank you for your comments on that, uh, especially Erica Higgins, because I, I mean, Huggins, I, I kind of put you in that special uh, group of like September Clark and Alba Latuli that decide to be educators in the midst of struggle, right? And when the struggle is happening, the real questions come about, right? And so um, as an educator, someone who taught in the classroom too, uh, you got to kind of deal with that complexity. But it sounds like you all kind of had a recipe of love and good instruction and other things happening that really empower these students and just believe that they can empower themselves. So I appreciate you answering that from one educator to a senior educator. Thank you for answering that question for me because I'm going to use that tomorrow. One of the other questions that came in, um, I guess there's a story about the school council. I guess there was a school council that was happening at the time. And where I guess uh, also there's this space where the children themselves um, can solve problems upon the guidance and upon th this love umbrella that we have for them, but they still have to solve some conflict. And Tiffany kind of uh, mentioned that a little bit. So uh, can you all share that question with us a little? I don't know if y'all know about that school council or is, it, is, is there something that we need to, can you describe that? Oh, the Oakland Community School um, Advisory Board. I know, I, yes, I helped the students to create it. They came up with it. You know, okay. one of the ways that we functioned was we, we really listened when my door was always open. The only time my door was closed as director, which is kind of like principal, but I didn't like that term, um, was when I wanted to talk privately with a family. Other than that, even when I was talking to staff, door was open, children walk in. Erica, I got a question. And I would do my best, depending upon what was going on, to sit with that child and answer. And one day, a child came in and said, "We some people do their homework and other people don't. And I said, ooh, you having a feeling about that, huh? Yeah, because I do my homework all the time. And so the response was, well, do you ever think that there's some people who can't do their homework because they might have to take care of their little sister or brother or they have to help make dinner before mom gets home from work or whatever those things are. No, I never thought about it. I said, but is there something that you, since you're bringing this idea to me, is there something the school can do? Is there something you can do that will help students to figure out a way to get their work at home done or to be better contributors to the Oakland Community School community. And that child and a number of children became the justice board or the advisory board. You know, things don't have to have the same name. You know what I mean? It, it can fluctuate. Everything is not nicely in a box with a bow on it. And, um, but how it worked is that there would be children who rotated on and off of that board, they would sit there and they would be with a child who hadn't done her homework or who got in an argument with another child that didn't end well. Or whatever the childhood things are that we all went through or the child was feeling sullen and 
isolated in class and wasn't contributing anymore, a child who normally contributed. So the, so the justice board would bring the child there with an adult advisor quietly in the room, just, just there in case the children needed something. And they would ask, well, why do you think you don't do your homework? Can we investigate that? Because they love that word investigate. And um, so that they wouldn't make assumptions. And then the child would say something like, I don't know why I do it. Well, why do you think? It was like a, a, a conversation. There was nothing punitive about it. Although the children could be very direct. And my favorite one is in a documentary, remember Angela about Oakland Community School. Um, there's a special documentary that was done by LeVar Burton in his show called Rebop. Um, and I think she says it in this, this child is asked why she didn't do her homework. And she said, I don't know, I just, I guess I'm just trifling. And, you know, you want to laugh because that term is so full of nuance and history. But she seemed sad about it. So the, so the children talking to her, they didn't laugh. They were quiet. And they said, well, what do you think you should do? And she said, well, maybe I shouldn't watch so much TV. And it turned out well, when we're punitive, it doesn't ever turn out well, nothing changes. And we watch beautiful things unfold there. And the students on the advisory board, could that next week be coming to the advisory board? So there, there wasn't, it wasn't hierarchical is what I'm trying to say. So is that what you were asking about, Brian? Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. And, not, and, and more because you, you said a model quite a bit, but I think in that last illustration, you kind of um, gave an example of what a model is, right? It's, it's a lot of people haven't so, seen that kind of uh, healthy problem solving and you all in this school, that's what we do as educators, we give them you, we expose them to, to, to things such as that. So that was a beautiful story. And that, that didn't just happen at the Justice Board. It happened in my office. It happened in classrooms. It happened in the cafeteria. There were always conversations going on where we were exploring the difference between the truth about something and an assumption or just downright gossip. <laughs> and, and it really, it strengthened as Angela said, it gave the, the children agency to, to look at things carefully, to turn the diamond and look at all its facets, right? So um, it was a wonderful learning environment. And I know I learned so much from those children and those families. Thank you. Thank you. All right, for our next question, we have um, an audience member, Jennifer Terry. And Jennifer, if you're still there, I can unmute you if you would like to ask your question. Thank you so much. Uh, what an amazing panel. Thanks to everybody involved. I'm learning so much. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a question that Damien raised. It said the second question, if I remember it right. Um, which is about fugitive spaces of learning. And the reason I was thinking about that is as a university professor who is seeing what, you know, the assault on education, but also realizing that the university is not by any means the only place to learn. Um, I've been involved a lot in a lot of the uprising uh, activities of the summer. Um, and I was just struck by my encounters with young organizers and young activists of color mainly. Uh, and the way that they're learning from each other and the way that they're teaching us about history. Um, and so I was thinking I, not to, you know, romanticize or glorify, you know, protest as, as the best or only side of learning, but I was just, you know, wondering, Damien, if you might say something and Erica too about, you know, or anyone uh, about spaces of learning that are so fugitive in nature that they're, but they might be precisely for that reason, an amazing place to learn. Thanks.
All right, I see there's a pause, which usually means that yeah. you want me to go first, Erica. Is that? <laughs> no logic or Angela or anything. <laughs> Okay, so I'll, I'll have just a quick response um, to that, which is, I think one of the hardest parts of sort of realizing the beauty of such fugitive spaces is making it legible to understand that not only is it common sense, but that it is actually needed because the common sense so much is trying to enact a process of continued violence through normative construction. That could be curriculum development that looks a certain way. That could be surveillance technologies that just look normal. We need to have police in our schools because it creates safety for our children. All of these sort of commonsensical understandings of what education should be, of how people should be in the world. And in these um, spaces, such as the Oakland Community School, what we see is something radically different and oftentimes is illegible. That is, it doesn't make sense to what is actually taught as what participating in the civic should be. And that goes back to this long history that we've um, discussed in terms of what is the function and purpose of education in the United States and how that has all these sort of multifaceted connections to other parts of the state, the carceral state, healthcare systems, housing, so on and so forth. And I think the beauty of these spaces is much what Erica just laid out in the previous response, which was that when you give, in particular, this experience of Black youth, the opportunity to just be free, you will see that the analysis of political relationships, the analysis of the economy, the analysis of their own well being, of their community, it's all there. Like there's no need to have to put like to, to teach the youth to do a certain thing. All of that information is there. As a matter of fact, that is part, probably one of the main sites of tension is that black youth are already coming with a knowledge base in place to public education, which is trying to reproduce a particular knowledge base that oftentimes goes against what the, the knowledge is that, that they're already coming to school with. And so when you allow that to flourish and allow that to be and just give resources to that, then in fact, what happens is something beautiful. Now, that beauty also is mitigated by the fact that, you know, you have these real world problems, which is how do you provide housing? How do you provide food? All these things sort of are in place, but I think it's important to take out of sort of like the, the critical ensconcement that is already there and then just support that as opposed to try to replace it with something else. So how can we provide more research, more resources so that that in itself can just flourish? So beautiful what you said, that's really beautiful. Because it's so true and so simple. Hmm. We have one last question from Tara. Um, Tara, I'm going to allow you to talk. Um, do you feel comfortable speaking your question? Yes, hi. Uh, Erica, you mentioned that the fact that the majority of our students and specifically black students are in public education. And I'm wondering therefore, uh, are, is there any hope <laughs> for public education uh, to support the well being for our students who are not able to enter into those fugitive states, state, uh, spaces, who are essentially stuck in public education. And simultaneously, uh, are there any ways to support the well being of students within that context and their diverse teachers, uh, some of whom might be nurturers? and some who might um, be heavily invested in the punitive dimensions of their roles as teachers. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Tara. And I'm remembering um, an event that uh, Angela and I um, um, well, we helped to plan it. And then we were there for the whole day of this um, celebration of 
radical community education and of all places, the De Young Museum in San Francisco, which has been uh, very, 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 very um, Europe, European American and wealthy. And they hired a person who to bring in um, installments, ex exhibits, installations that uh, would welcome people of color. So there was a whole lot that went on. But suffice it to say on this particular day, there was a celebration of Oakland Community School. And Tara, so many people asked this question. There were so many young educators there um, who had just finished a doctoral degree in education or were, were teachers at public schools and they were just begging us to tell them what to do. And I asked many of them, this was in a, um, a, a big community conversation, if they wanted to stay where they were. And most of them wanted to open a school, but they were hesitant. And I said, well, if you stay where you are, um, as Bell Hook says, you have to teach to transgress. You take a risk that in your classroom, something different can happen. And it catches fire. I've seen this happen time and again. Not that you are refuting what your principal or vice principal tells you, but you're not punitive. You might begin your day like the day that begins for the fifth graders in a little school down the street from where I live, where they breathe together. And if things get a little bit um, off focus, there's a little tinkling bell that gets rung to bring them back to focus. And this teacher brings in speakers. I go in and speak to public school classrooms all of the time, even virtually, Tara. I think we have amazing imagination, don't we? And because somebody else is wanting it to be stifled, doesn't mean that we let it be stifled. We can think of ways to turn our public school classrooms into havens of learning. I really believe that because I have seen it happen with my own eyes and it gives me hope. Now, if you're like this wonderful, young, uh, brilliant educator that wanted to start her own school, then you put on your brave pants and your courage hat and you go and you do it. And I promised people that I would help them if they ever wanted to do that, but they have to want to do it and not let the challenges keep them in cement boots. Do you follow me, Tara? And about the people who believe in the punitive practices, there are always those people. But there are, there are organizations like the one I'm going to name right now, the Black Teacher Project. Oh my goodness. You need to look them up. Um, and um, they, are, they are in you know, public education and charter education, and they are there to do exactly what you just named, Tara. So um, I think if you look up BTP or Black, teacher project. Their motto is every child should have a black teacher. I just think it's wonderful because of the nuanced meaning of that. Um, so I hope I answered your question. Um, we can all do the, the most we can do wherever we are in the skin that we're in with the skills and experience and understanding that we have. Erica, thank you so much. You're welcome. So we, we said that was going to be our last question, but you know how educators do. We throw one more in, right? <laughs> so we do. <laughs> Only because uh, Dr. Crooks uh, kind of dropped a term on us. And so we want to allow Evelyn to kind of ask her question, if possible, Dr. Crooks.
Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, yeah, my name is Evelyn. I just was a bit curious about Dr. Crooks. Um, he used the word civic computational regime and I guess someone who doesn't know the terminology, I was hoping um, you could also expand on what that means and how that could look like in other learning spaces other than in school, um, particularly like that you said it, that would stay and remain accountable to Black, Indigenous, and or other people of color. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Um, and also I learned so much from my other panelists today, so I have to say thank you for that um, now that I have the mic. But um, what I was thinking, first civic computational regime is a, a term that I have coined that is entirely speculative. So it has no fixed meaning as yet. So it's more like, what could it mean? And so I think what it means is that it would involve some kind of education whose virtue is, whose whose kind of ver ethical commitments were explicit first. So we would say we're shooting for something civic. And then I think as a practical question, you could look for some of the uh, work of my colleagues at the Connected Learning Labs. And so they have invented many kind of inventive ways of teaching authentically and effectively using technology. But the most important thing for me is that the use of technology um, would not be the center of this education, that the center of the education would be something like what the Panthers 10 point program calls community control of modern technology. And so the radical thing would be that it took the lived experiences of people of color seriously, that it gave uh, people of color a way to talk about their lived experiences and incorporate that into some kind of educational system that held up and really ratified that experience. So. To me, it's more about what could it mean? And so that's what I, that's what I hope it could mean. I mean, I think a lot of what I heard today made me feel hopeful. Mm. Well, thank you, Evelyn. And thank you, Dr. Crooks for that last um, question and answer. Um, our time has really flown by. Um, so I'd like to say thank you, thank you, thank you to our panelists, um, our post panel facilitators and the audience for helping to make this event like just truly inspirational. Um, and I would like to extend a special thank you to Professor Judy Wu, who has worked tirelessly to oversee UCI's 1619 series. Um, the series continues this Thursday, October 22nd at 5pm with a panel on financial legacies slavery and the history of banking. Uh, for more information and to register for upcoming 1619 events, including um, an interview on, on October 29th um, of Nicole Hannah-Jones, the acclaimed journalist who spearheaded the New York Times Magazine's uh, The 1619 Project. Please visit the UCI Humanities Center website. Um, I'd like to put in another plug or rather a reminder, um, today is the last day in California to register um, online or by mail to vote. So please visit um, register to vote.ca.gov. Um, and that's our end of the, the event. And again, thank you all for your, spending your evening with us. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Crystal. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, everybody. Thanks Thank so much. Roderick and Damien and Angela and Judy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That was